Thank you for joining us for tonight's program on the innovative technology and thinking in agriculture and food systems needed to meet the growing needs of a growing global population with Dr. Roger Beachy and Jim Vonderheit. I'm Claire Noble, the program manager for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our executive director, Dale Mosier, our board chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. For nearly 50 years, the Vail Symposium has been bringing our community affordable, thought-provoking programming in the beautiful Vail, Colorado. Some program notes before we get started. To ask questions and make comments to tonight's speakers, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. I'll monitor that and then share those comments and questions with our speakers later in tonight's program. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It is being recorded, and you'll be able to find that recording at veilsymposium.org. Just give us a couple of days to get that posted. Big thanks to tonight's sponsors, the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Also, thank you to our underwriters. Underwriting the summer season are Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher. Underwriting the Environmental Awareness Series are Holly and Buck Elliott. And thanks also to Alpine Bank for supporting our virtual programs. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Funding has been provided to the Vail Symposium by Colorado Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, Economic Stabilization Plan 2020. If you're a Vail Symposium donor, thank you very much. If you'd like to become one, please visit veilsymposium.org. Also, please plan to join us a week from tonight on Thursday, September 10th, also at 6 p.m., when Dr. John Hausdorfer addresses the question, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? This is another in our series on environmental awareness. Dr. Hausdorfer presents an opportunity in time of crisis, where the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of how connected we are. Tonight, we turn our attention to agriculture and food systems. Dr. Roger Beachy is the professor of biology at Washington University. He was appointed by President Obama to the National Science Board and was director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. He also was the uh, founding executive director of the World Food Center and later senior science advisor at the World Center, UC Davis. He was the founding president of the nonprofit Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Beachy holds a PhD in plant pathology from Michigan State University and a BA in bi biology from Goshen College in Goshen, Indiana. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Arizona and at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. Jim Vonderheit is a principal of Warson Capital Partners with many years of experience as an innovative business leader with a diverse background in highly competitive global industries. Since 2002, Jim has operated InnoVentures, a consulting firm he established to provide strategic planning, product development, and capital strategies for growing companies. InnoVentures services include roles as advisor, founder, director, and investment banker, including founding president and CEO of Nagon Products, director of Clayton Capital Partners, and chairman of DDS. Jim served in key leadership positions with the Ralston Purina Company, now Nestle Purina, from 1981 through 2002. He holds a BS from Drake University and an MSJ from Northwestern University. I'm going to turn the program now over to Dr. Beachy. He and um, Jim Vonderheit will be in conversation during um, Dr. Beachy's presentation. And again, if you have a question for either of our speakers this evening, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and I'll share that with them later in the program. Dr. Beachy? Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you tonight. I wish it was in person. Uh, Vail's a lovely place to be, as we all know, and it'd be nice to see faces as well as to hear voices and questions. But we have what we have, and we'll do our very best to 
have a, a stimulating conversation tonight about uh, innovative technology and the kind of thoughts and processes that some of us in the science field and the innovation field, uh, are, I think, are, I believe are necessary to meet the global challenge. A challenge is, is, um, is fostered by a, a great deal of, of um, new innovation. What I wanted to talk on, on this slide, if which should have shown each of those individually uh, as in, in a video format, was, the, um, was that there are a lot of questions that come to mind when one thinks about agriculture uh, and, and food. How you, how you approach food as an individual or how society approaches food comes because of our awareness of who we are. We are, we are more knowledgeable about diet. We know about microbiomes in, in, in people and the effect of, of nutrition and, and medicines on microbiome inside our, our intestinal uh, tract. We think about so, social, social justice. Uh, who has food? What kind of food? How much nutrition do they have from it? What are the impacts of climate change on, uh, on agriculture and, and on food prices? Trade policies on food prices. And a lot of, uh, so all of this uh, together helps us to determine our attitude towards food and, uh, and what its role and what role it plays, but also how society, how, how we will approach society in the future uh, with, with changes in, in climate and numbers of people and, and all of the factors that together um, raise, are raised in our awareness of challenges in meeting a, uh, the food and nutrition needs of a growing population. Part of this is because we know more about foods than we have ever known before. We know about the chemistry of foods. We know about processing of foods and, and the impacts of processing on nutrition and on those who eat them. We know about uh, the, uh, the importance of certain kinds of foods in our diets, whether it's fish or, or grain or poultry. And all together, we care about our family and those that, that we interact with with regard to their dietary uh, components. And, and as a consequence, we buy for, for certain reasons, which are, are structural. They may be ethnic. They, they have lots of things uh, that impact on what our diet is. At the same time, we have also a recognition that, that there are changes in, in the climate that, that, uh, uh, that happen around the world. Um, and during the, in this little video, which takes awareness of temperatures from the 1900s to, to near the uh, present, the blue bars represent uh, the years when uh, the climate is cooler than normal around the globe. You see changes in Europe and, and the U.S., and as we get farther and farther into the 1990s and the 2000s, we see much less blue and colder, cooler than uh, average year and to more red and orange, which are the years where there's a higher temperature than normal. And you saw that switch at around 1995 or 2000. Uh, we've, the, the last few years are out, but they'd be very much the same as you see here in 2016. What that tells us is that climate is has become warmer on the globe. And as a consequence, the impact on agriculture is significantly different. What those climate, climate, uh, climate, climactic changes have brought are a uh, little stress, more stress on water. Um, the amount of water that agriculture uses is someplace between 70 and 80% of the amount of fresh water on the globe is devoted to agriculture. We know that, that with changes in, in temperature, that uh, there are changes in arability of land. We see uh, more, more deserts in the sub-Saharan, uh, in, the, in the Saharan area of Africa. We see it in, uh, in Mexico to our south, and we see it in parts of Eastern Europe and in, in, in the Mideast. But, uh, and, and as that happens, uh, what climatologists and agriculturists have come to realize is that uh, with climate change, uh, it is predicted that there will be 13 to 16 percent lower productivity in agriculture by 2080. That's a significant change when one considers the, that the amount of people that are expected to habit Earth are someplace north of 9.5 to 10 billion people by 2080, according to some demographers. At the same time, the science and, and uh, technology that's led to what, what's known as productivity gain, that is you know, the uh, increase in general productivity of, of, of crops 
around the world has slowed from about a 2% annual increase in productivity of, of crops to 1%. And, and that at the same time that we're losing uh, air, arable land and we're having more people on, on this earth. Uh, I'll, I'll pause for a second to see if Jim has any That's additional good. comments he wants to make on this. Yeah, Roger, this is Jim. Can I, I trust you can hear me. Uh, I, yes. I always thought, I was under the impression that uh, productivity was actually being increased in our large field crops. Uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, it shows that that rate of increase from productivity is not as great. Uh, what's causing the uh, decline in the growth of productivity in these big, important crops? Well, in the lighter color here, Jim, it calls this the annual yield increase of major crops. Uh, the major crops being rice and wheat and corn and soy, uh, which are the major grains around, that are used around the globe. And, and what this reflects is that over the last 50 years or 60 years, uh, there's been a, a lot of effort going, going into increasing the productivity by plant breeding and by stewardship of, of land. Uh, that has led to kind of an exhaustion of new information that can be brought into new crops by plant breeding. Uh, we know a lot about corn and we know how to increase its, its uh, yields. And we've really maxed out in corn because we've exploited the wild, the native germplasm or the wild germplasm that's, that's in the progenitors of corn. That's not the case in all, in all crops. For example, sorghum continues to increase, but that's a relatively small acreage crop compared to sor uh, corn, soy, and, uh, and other, uh, other crops. So we've okay. exploited, the, we've developed as much as we can, I think, in some of these crops. Does that help? Yes. Oh, good. Thanks, Jim. Well, uh, while we're, we're seeing a, a modest decline in crop productivity, uh, we also recognize the role that agriculture plays in developing greenhouse gases. And as greenhouse gases increase in our, uh, around our troposphere, uh, there is an increase in, in uh, temperature on, on the planet. And we know now that uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that are released through, through agriculture and there are in the range of 28% of global greenhouse gases. Energy from fossil fuels, for example, is about 60, 40% all energy uses. So that's the second most important uh, amongst the generators of greenhouse gases. And, and the question is, is there something that science should be doing to reduce the use of, uh, or the release of these agriculture uh, greenhouse gases, just as we are looking for ways to limit the, uh, energy, uh, the uh, fossil fuel energy release of, of um, greenhouse gases. So a study out of, and some work that came out of Princeton a year or two ago uh, propose that, that uh, we must find ways to maximize food production while we reduce greenhouse gases from agriculture. And they provide five op opportunities to do that. One is to reduce the growth in demand, perhaps, and change the, may, perhaps change the preferences we have for food. Reduce food, food waste. Uh, a, a week or so ago, there was a report uh, a, from, from China uh, recognizing that there are 1.4 billion people are, are wasting a lot of food, are, are calling now for reduction in food waste in China, which uh, is struggling to, uh, has struggled to produce a, enough food for their, uh, for their use. And, and that's a, a major component, one that we can address perhaps. Uh, there is the, the issue of uh, increase in food production on existing lands. We need to increase or the intensification of agriculture. So each good acre of land produces a maximum amount of yield that it can, while at the same time making sure that we take care of the soil and we ensure that it's there for the long haul. As the same, oh, there's also a call to protect and restore natural ecosystems. And, uh, and, for that, and the purpose for that, of course, is that it, as we have more prairie grasses and more forest, we capture uh, CO2, carbon monoxide, and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and, and the limit is to um, uh, asking for a limit on agricultural land shifting. Now, what that means is um, limit, for example, urban sprawl. Uh, often in our, uh, our, our uh, primary cities are surrounded by agriculture land that's fertile. That's the reason the, the cities were put there in the first place. 
and by shifting more of the land away from agriculture into, or excuse me, urban use, um, there's a, a we reduce our our opportunity to uh, produce food. Uh, it's also suggested we increase fish supply so we make better use of our oceans, and at the same time reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture production processes. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next coming several slides. Jim, is that clear enough? Does that that, set out that, the uh, that challenges? Be, uh, I think that that does it. Let's keep moving. Right. One, uh, so several, several examples of, of ways that agriculture is searching and working towards reducing greenhouse gas emission is to, for example, to use uh, new varieties of rice. Rice is a big producer of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, and flooded rice, and finding ways to reduce that activity. Um, manage manure more effectively to reduce methane and nitrous, nitrous oxide emission. And uh, change the diets of, of cattle, or develop new variety, new strains and lines of cattle that uh, release less methane from front end of the back end, front end of the back end of the cattle. So scientists are looking at all of those options to reduce uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture. And uh, another way is to, is, as consumers may shift to alternate meats as a consequence or ultimate. Uh, um, sort of not real meat, but, but substitute meat, uh, because they choose a, a low greenhouse gas diet. Uh, this happens to be, I think, from Impossible Burger, I saw today that they're going to show up in Target, as well as uh, Target Foods, as well as in uh, Kroger, our local uh, supermarkets. Uh, so there are changes that are happening in availability of, of foods, and people will, will make choices accordingly. At the same, so while all of this is going on, the scientists that do the plant breeding uh, recognize that with changes in climate, which could be as much as uh, two and a half degrees uh, above what it was in 2080 from what it was in 2016, we expect to have more pests. And the chemical companies are looking for new pesticides that will control the increase in pests. We increase by as much as 20 to 25 percent more pests might require 20 to 25% more insecticide. There's a battle for water, and uh, with the increase in people and the increase in climate, we will need more water uh, for available for individuals, for our population. That growing population may, may reach nearly 10 billion, it's expected to. The, uh, the, the pessimistic view was 14 billion by the end of the year. Uh, more demographers are, are settling on something between nine and a half and 10. And, there's going to, and there will be less arable land as there is more, uh, more temperature rise. Plant breeders have, have recognized this and are struggling through their plant breeding processes to solve those issues. Now, plant breeding has, has evolved over the years from, from the early 1900s. Uh, in the early 1900s and through most of, uh, through today, uh, it, it was standard for a plant breeder to to uh, use wild varieties, in this case of tomato, and cross it because, and if that wild variety contains, let's say, insect resistance to a disease or a pest, crossing that genetics or the germplasm there with a nice red juicy tomato, in order to transfer the pest resistance from this variety to this one, uh, can be done. It takes about 10 to 12 years to do that. Because if, if you make a genetic cross between these two, you carry a lot of genes that you don't want, and you have to eliminate those by what's called back crossing, and you get a, eventually a variety that you want with the, with the trait you want. Uh, in the uh, 80s and uh, late 70s and early 80s and through the 90s, we've used genetic engineering in which we might isolate a gene for insect resistance, in this case, from uh, potatoes or from corn or rice and introduce it in, into the tomato. So you'd have a, a potato gene in, in, in the tomato and it would have the resistance that you want. Uh, that's called genetic engineering or transgenetics. That's, there's a, a, another method of genetic engineering that uh, is more popular and more likely to be successful and perhaps adopted. And that is to use a gene from the wild variety that you identify through studies and isolate that gene by molecular tools transfer it to tomatoes to give you the, the trait you want. More recently, we've used gen, uh, gene editing, which is the uh, science of changing one or two genetic letters in, a, in the tomato to so that it has a trait 
of this wild tomato, but is, has less um, introduction of other kinds of genetic information. This is for some of the gene editing works remarkably well for some traits, but not for others. Now, I'll give you just an example of, of some work that I can't do, can't do science unless I show you, well, I can't show you. This is a, uh, this is a technology that, that my lab developed in the uh, 1980s. And it's, it's pretty dramatically shown here, although I had a few slides to show you on the way there. Uh, this, is, this is peanuts, ground nuts, as it's known in Southeast Asia and South Asia. This is a, a, a field of, of a, a ground nut or peanut that is severely affected by a disease. Uh, that disease is caused by a virus. I happen to be a virologist as part of my training and my research interest. And my lab developed a way for, to do genetic engineering of crops, including tomatoes and cucumbers and, and other crops. And, uh, and it allowed me to develop varieties of, of uh, crops that are resistant to specific viruses. So with, at the invitation of the, the institute in which I worked in, uh, collaborated or, or consulted in India, we applied the technology to groundnut. Here's an example of a peanut that's been affected by the virus. And this is one that has implant, where we had implanted a single gene uh, from the virus and we now have an immune, an immune plant. This technology is, is powerful, can be used in, uh, in most crops. Another example of uh, genetic engineering is, is shown here in, uh, in, in the slide that is from a company called Performance Plants. I, I happen to sit on, I sit on their board of directors as a science advisor. And Performance Plants, along with other companies, has identified genes that uh, help the crop, help to um, provide tolerance to drought or reduced amount of, of water. In this case, this is canola, this is rice. And each of these crop varieties have been and increased, uh, have been had their their water use efficiency or the amount of water they use reduced by genetic engineering, a powerful tool that allows uh, farmers to, to uh, grow productive crops with less water. Now, most of the work that was done early on was in crops such as corn and soy. At the same time, scientists are, are looking for ways to increase the nutrition, nutritional value of, of uh, crops or to work on, on crops such as as eggplant and uh, help them to become resistant to diseases. In this case, this is, this is papaya that you can't see underneath because you're not seeing the, the, um, the video portion of this. Uh, the first genetically engineered uh, food crop that was released to the market uh, was papaya using the technology that I described earlier for virus resistance. This is, this is uh, ground nut or uh, uh, eggplant that's grown in Bangladesh and India. Uh, the, the pest pressures on growing um, eggplant in that part of the world are remarkable and farmers are known to use between 80, to spray their crop between 80 and 120 times per season. And the season is only about 150 days long. Uh, using genetic engineering, it was, uh, it was an implanting of a, of a gene into this crop which allows it to be highly resistant to the pest and, and farmers spray between zero and 10 times per season instead of 120. A real benefit to the environment and to the farmers who have to spray it. And of course it's safer for the consumer. This is an example of a uh, of cassava and, uh, and underneath this, this picture of a carrot is, um, is a genetically modified cassava or manioc, which is orange. Um, genes were transplanted from uh, crops that have a lot of beta carotene and produce a lot of vitamin A in our body into other crops. Here's an example in rice. You can see what, wild, uh, what normal rice looks like. It's white. And, and this uh, variety of rice carries a gene from corn and another one from, um, I can't remember the second crop, but from two crop plants translated and uh, transplanted into rice to provide a highly nutritious uh, rice variety that's called golden rice and is able to be, uh, 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 to confer high, high diet uh, capabilities or a healthy diet to those who consume it. 
But we're really on the, on the cusp of, a, of a, third green, a third revolution in agriculture, one that was early on in our, in our evolution, which was, um, tr gave good transportation and, um, and using grain elevators and steam engines and so forth. That's, that was very important for in the early times of, 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 uh, of the culture in Europe and in the US and around the globe. There was then a second green revolution that was created as we call it, through modern plant breeding, the kind of tools I showed you earlier, using DNA markers to help the plant breeders breathe faster, do their work more effectively. At the same time, uh, just, just prior to that, was the era of synthetic fertilizers. We could not have the kind of variety, uh, the uh, yields that we have in our agriculture without synthetic fertilizers. And we've become dependent on pesticides to, um, to ensure that the crop is not destroyed by, by insects and pe other pests. And we use genetically modified organisms to do things uh, more, more naturally in some ways uh, and, and uh, certainly more efficiently for the farmers. But that's changing. Agriculture is now a, a science, a highly science-driven enterprise that makes use of big data, that uses sensors in the field to generate data about the soil, soil temperature, soil moisture, fertilizer and so forth, and uh, tractors that are built with computers that, that can, can uh, plow a straight line and can work, work different kinds of soil in different ways. Collecting all that information and feeding it into massive computer databases helps us to un, uh, be able to tell the farmer exactly where to put the fertilizer or the pesticide or the water. Uh, this kind of a systems approach to agriculture is really the revolution that we're seeing in agriculture these days. I'm gonna give you two examples of, of, of the new science that's being implemented. One is a study of microbiology. We're well aware of microbiomes in our, in our gut system. It turns out plants have a, 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 an active microbiome of its, of its own. And of course, the soil is full of its own bacteria and fungi. Some are good and some are bad. They have their own microbiome. The combination between soil and microbiome that the root of the plant grows in and, uh, and the amount of and the microbiome inside the plant together uh, work with the genetics of the, crop, of the plant to have in, uh, uh, tolerance or resistance to insects or fungi or virus diseases or tolerance to weeds. These are biotic uh, stresses that the plant faces. There are also abiotic stresses such as droughts and heat and cold and the, and the microbes in the soil, the microbes in the plant work together with the genetics of the crop to be either tolerant or intolerant to those kinds of stresses. Science in this field has just exploded in the last four or five years. We are now seeing microbial products that are nature's own uh, diversity and applying to the leaves of crops or to the soil and, uh, and creating uh, a better environment for the plant to survive in. Here's a specific drill down example that I want to talk about just very briefly. This is a, a company that I work with in, in Ireland and they're focused on heavy metals in, in foods. Turns out that rice uh, absorbs arsenic from the water, from the soil, as, as does wheat. Uh, other, other crops and vegetables, for example, take up cadmium to levels that are toxic to human beings. And, and when this happens, uh, then the FDA becomes involved and, and, and health providers become involved and say, and, and, and really are asking now agriculture to reduce the uptake of these heavy metals into foods. Cocoa, chocolate is a high in, in cadmium in, in, when produced in certain areas of the globe. Of course, we don't want chocolate to go away. So what this company has done is focused on identifying the microbes that to be added to the soil right around the roots to reduce the uptake of arsenic and cadmium. And they've been remarkably successful. They already have products on the market in China and are exploring opportunities here in the US. Now that will, be, that will mean not new crop varieties, but new varieties of microbes. So the microbes are our friends if we, if we use them correctly. Another technology that I find exciting is, is the use of of uh, nanomaterials to uh, help uh, protect uh, crops from, from decaying too rapidly. In this, in this case, 
you see bananas that have, are coated with a natural biomaterial. I've heard of one that comes from the albumin from, from milk, which can be applied to, to vegetables and, and fruits. And the, on the left side here, you see those that did not have the coating. And it's extremely effective. And that cuts down the, the, issue, the uh, problem of, 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 um, of waste. And, and, and of course, that was one of the four or five important uh, components of, of addressing greenhouse gas emission. So you've, you've seen examples of technology tonight, and, and there's much more that I could tell you about. Uh, science is moving very quickly uh, in this field, just as it is in medicine. And the slide that I'm showing here, and that should appear in, in, in is, is really to ask, begin to ask the question. So first of all, who cares? And secondly, who does the consumer trust to bring them technology in their food? And, and social scientists have looked at this over the course of the last five years or, or 10 years and begun to ask the question about uh, what the, what, what's important to consumers. And it's, what, what we, what we uh, have learned is that if the scientists, if the, big, if the companies share the values of the consumer, that trust between the consumer and, the, uh, and the, the company or the scientist gives that company or scientist social license. And, and that provides freedom to operate. So what's most important on this, in this balance is that the, they share values uh, about environment, about health, about well-being, about family, whatever the issue is for the consumer, if they know that the private sector, the company, or the scientist shares their, their uh, values, then they are, they are afforded a uh, social license that gives them the opportunity of freedom to operate. In this, bal in this balance picture you see here, the fulcrum, uh, skills are important, but it's not my skill that will convince you that my science is good. It's whether or not you think that I have your best interest at heart that gives me social license and then to use technologies. Now, what makes sense for research um, and business does not always make sense for consumers. So we have to be uh, aware that the shared values are, uh, show that there's three to, time, three to five times more, in, or as shared values are, are three to five times more important in building trust than my simply being, being able to perform a technological feat. So, and, and as we understand more about that, that differential, the greater chance, or, or what, what the consumer sees, the greater chance of science and technology will be afforded the opportunity to provide, to provide the, the uh, solutions that will help us to overcome the challenges of providing the, 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 uh, the world with a, uh, with a highly valuable uh, and useful technology. Old agriculture has been wonderful, but it's, it's challenges that we have more people. And so we're gonna need new technologies to address those, uh, those needs, or we will in fact continue to degrade the environment by, by planting crops in the, in the wrong areas, then, then, then uh, where, where there's a stress on water or, or high temperatures. We'll be using drones to monitor uh, what crops, how crops grow, sensors that will help us to, to the farmer to do his job better, more effectively without negative impacts on the, on the environment. And we'll see, we'll continue to see at, uh, changes in technology and food, food growth and in food production. I, I hope that, that I, in this little overview, you get a sense that, that those of us in the science community are, are really terribly interested in, in being useful. It's not just the fact that we know how to discover things. We want to be useful. On my role at the National Science Board, we've had these discussions about whether or not, uh, or what the obligation is of a, of a scientist in a university or in a company. How do we use, how do we use your tax dollars to, to make sure that you're healthy in food and nutrition just as much as you expect health and wellness that goes to the NIH? or, or um, technology that protects us in the, in the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, and we wanna use that, that, uh, that wisely and to contribute to the health and well-being of, of uh, the globe and those that inhabit it. Jim, I've not given you many chances for, for questions here. 
Uh, that's the end of my talk. I, I, uh, I would welcome questions from, from Jim and others um, from here. I think we're right about on time, Claire. I think that uh, I think one of the, the embedded side stories, Roger, to the story that you told about how science is advancing is the way that industry is following that and innovation is being commercialized by industry. You talked a lot about the, uh, the growth of, of uh, the scientific community and the breadth of it, but you know, farming and agriculture is not just for folks who grow up on the farm anymore. We're seeing a tremendous growth of uh, startup companies and the government is making significant investments in artificial intelligence and other applied areas that will take the systems approach that you showed uh, to the new level. And well, the other thing that we're seeing about is the emergence of the convergence of big data from a variety of sources, from financial in, in industries, from the health, human health industries and ag industries, they're all converging and discovering many things. I think as a virologist, I want to throw a slightly different question to you. Uh, now, that, now that we all know about the dangers of viruses, how do you tell the story about virus dangers in plants? You've been doing that for years. I, I think there are several things that, I, that have become evident. Um, as we've caused ingress into, into the tropics or into areas where there isn't agriculture, we've discovered that there are a lot of other pests and path, a lot of other pests and pathogens that are in fact in the forests and, and in the wetlands. Uh, and as humans enter those areas uh, more often, there's more likelihood of a new strain of a pathogen coming out. But just as in human and animal pathogens, uh, plant viruses uh, have a real propensity for mutation and change. And, and, every, and when there's a, 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 a crop that's grown repeatedly, sort of in monoculture, those strains can change um, in, some, in some kind of viruses very, very rapidly. And, and what that means is there's always a challenge in, in virology uh, that, that is caused by that selection that agriculture places on the environment. And having tools to control those, those viruses is a real challenge. I see it as a real challenge. Uh, and, and in many communities, a farmer will have to use an insecticide to, let's say, kill the aphids that carry the viruses. Um, that contributes to environmental degradation, in my opinion. And we should be using genetics and ge genetic engineering tools that can, that can protect crops. The technology is so very facile, so easy to use. It's now off patent. <laughs> we got 17 years of protection off the technology. It's now generic. And there are ways that this, this is far beyond uh, large company science. It's, it really can be done in, in uh, experiment stations in our universities. We're always faced with them, Jim, um, just as we are in human health. There was a question that, that came up about uh, identifying food companies that are on the forefront of of these innovations. And I think it's pretty easy for us to look at the, at the large publicly traded companies who are providing leadership and selling large quantities of, of uh, seed crops and others. But if people are really interested in understanding where the industry is going, there is a tremendous amount of startup activity and early stage companies that are being formed around these emerging technologies in support of what Roger is describing as a systems approach. So while the big guys are out there and we can watch what they're doing and see what they're doing, they're really at the far end of commercialization and they're years ahead of where the, uh, in the commercialization process, they're selling stuff that's been invented five, 10 and 15 years ago. The real growth in this industry is gonna come from the companies that are creating the new technologies that support the evolution of agriculture and new foods, and also the pathways that bring that technology to the marketplace. And a really good example of that is uh, the banana with the, the coating, uh, where there's huge yield loss in the consumption of, of, of foods. I think we talked earlier, Roger, about how 30% of the food loss may actually occur in the home once the food gets home. 
That's we good. can find ways to get fresher food and also get fresher, more preserved food, effectively food, a food that is effective for consumption, the yield loss at home can go down. And uh, that's a big, big way of teaching ourselves and our families how to prevent food loss. And if we do that on a community-wide basis, we can really see some change. And there are companies that are driving that in a big way. Indeed. And, and Jim, uh, what the science, what's, what this, this new technology, the systems approach is uh, of using various technologies to help the farmer is encouraging younger people to go to come back to agriculture. As you know, we, our, our agriculture right now suffers because of an aging population of, of producers of farmers. We're finding now sons and daughters and others from the cities now are, are exploring ways to get back into agriculture because it's, it's gotten more tools to use now than it had in the past. Uh, we're seeing in, in many ways in some of our land grant schools a real resurgence of those who want to be innovators, whether it's in microbiology or in sensor technology or data management. It's an exciting time, but we can't waste any time either because we are, we are getting warmer on this planet. We do have limited water resources and so forth. So it's a timely piece. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, though, Jim, that much of the innovation is in universities and in small companies. And, and then those that are, that are useful either grow on their own or absorb and by the larger companies, just as it does in the pharmaceutical industry. Roger, there's a question out here that we anticipated and it came. There's one from Amy and there's also okay. from Stephen. You talk about edit, gene editing and GMOs and really the, the bottom question is, wouldn't all the products you're discussing be considered GMOs and how do we know that they're safe for our family to eat? Uh, you've answered that question many times in the past, Roger. Uh, will you feed your grandchildren the tomatoes that you've genetically modified? And how do we know that they're safe? Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I, I, I have fed them <laughs> the, the tomatoes and I consume, continue to consume uh, crops that are, that are improved. There are several reasons I do. Uh, one, because much, many of the advances reduce the use of pesticides and and I'm a biologist, not a chemist, so I would prefer things be done biologically. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the editing of a, of a crop or using GMOs or cisgenetics or transgenetics is a process that is different than crossbreeding, but it's significantly more accurate and more precise. In the case of doing genetic crosses between crops, you might mix 10,000 genes from this plant and 10,000 genes from this plant together. In this case, I would take one gene from the same plant and implant it into tomato instead of, sorry, instead of having 10,001 genes whose function I don't understand, I transplant in one gene that is understood. That change is as natural as it can be. And, uh, and, and, and the, the new variety um, is, is considered to be safe after the test. That, that the FDA and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and, and uh, the EPA uh, recommend. The edit, the reg and so this is a regulated process that, that, really, uh, that is really very costly. Um, and the reason for that it's not done by small companies or universities anymore is because the cost is so bloody high. And, and that high cost means that many of the advances that come through genetic engineering don't make it here, even though they're extremely safe. So the, uh, the varieties of crops that have been released so far and, and uh, for sale are those that have been heavily regulated and heavily overseen with years of testing, uh, testing in the soil, testing, see how the birds do, testing how mice do and reproduce, testing how animals do. So there's a, there's a great deal of confidence that has built from the scientific perspective. Uh, the issue of, of why it's been difficult for some consumers to consider them safe is I think uh, lands on, on several, um, for several reasons. One, um, there's been not as much transparency between the scientists and the consumer that there should have been. There's not been the transparency between the private sector, large companies and what they do and, and telling you well in advance what's coming and why they think it's safe and, and why the, regu the uh, regulatory agencies think it's safe. That degree of transparency before all of this happens, before the variety comes to you, is really important. 
when we had our first field trial of tomatoes in 19, uh, I think it was uh, 87, 88 in Illinois, we had press releases and, and people came. There was, there was no, con no concern because what, at that point in time, because those who heard our story said that's an advantage for the farming community, it's an advantage for, the, for health and wellness to have less disease or less pesticide, less chemistry. As that went through the process the next 10 years, there was a, a, different, a different voice put on it. It came from outside the community and, uh, and, and we didn't anticipate it. So I, I think we need greater transparency early on and, uh, and share the excitement that we feel as scientists uh, as, as it, through the discovery process. If we can, and if we can save 20% of, of water for freshwater use by people rather than crops and animals, that'd be a wonderful thing to see for the future. And we can do that with science and, and technologies of all kind. So I hope that helps to answer the question, Jim. Uh, it, it's, it's a complicated one, and I'd love to do it over, over a glass of wine sometime because there are lots of facets to that. There's another question, Roger, that, that uh, I see the, that's referencing uh, Howard Shapiro's gene editing initiative to improve African orphan crops and help feed yes. developing uh -huh. countries. You know, this touches on a number of points that you touched on about where, where the growth is going to come in population, it's going to come in Africa. Right. How, it's gonna, how the African population is going to be fed, it's going to be fed by small rural farmers primarily. It's going to be subsistence crops. And, and how do we take this technology and is this technology being taken to Africa by Dr. Shapiro and are there other examples you could cite? Yes, uh, Dr. Shapiro, uh, in connection, in combination with the University of California, Davis, and the Mars Corporation have, have begun doing some DNA sequencing and, and genetics on, on uh, small farmer crops or, or crops of, of Africa uh, and have, have begun to train Africans on the use of, of modern plant breeding. And in some cases, uh, in, in genetic engineering, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, which I helped to start, um, has, uh, also has an activity towards training of African uh, scientists to go back to Africa for, uh, to use for their work in plant breeding and crop improvement. And as a consequence of that, we now have cadres of trained scientists, many of them, by the way, have been supported by the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, by the US Agency for International Development and other, and other sources of, of fellowships. And they now have gone back and established their own laboratories in Uganda, in, in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, some in, in, uh, in Tanzania. Uh, and as a consequence now, we're finding that African nations are making their own decisions about whether or not to use genetic engineering or gene editing in their own crops, done by their own scientists that have been trained in the, in the US or in Europe or in China, but are then now making their own decisions. So we're seeing positive upticks in adoption of, of the tools of genetic engineering in, in Nigeria and in Kenya, Africa, uh, some, I think, in Ghana, uh, but it's, 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 it's now done independently. Uh, they're still heavily influenced by, by the negative pressures and negative implications or uh, uh, testimony that comes out of uh, uh, some groups in, in Europe, but they're now making their own decisions. And the, the cassava that I showed you earlier, that was, that was uh, yellow instead of white, and now a virus-resistant cassava that was developed through technology that I told you about uh, and done at the Danforth Center and then in Kenya are, are finding their ways into a, approval through the process. And so we're excited because they wanna make their own decisions and they find that they can have better agriculture through the use of less chemistry and less more use of biology that they develop. So it's an exciting time in, in Africa. It's been very slow, Jim. Um, I said when, I, uh, when we invented that virus resistance technology that the biggest use of that science will be in Asia, South Asia, and Africa because they're in the tropics. Diseases are tougher in the tropics. And, uh, and, and in fact, that's turning to be the case. Chris, Claire, do you have a, a question that you want to throw in at this point? I know we're about up to the hour. 
so much. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Dr. Beachy, involves a speaker we had last year, uh, Louis Ziska, who at the time was with um, the USDA. I believe he's now at Columbia. And he's done research on the effects of rising levels of CO2 on the nutritional value of rice. I know earlier in the program, you were talking about the agricultural industry and the greenhouse gases it causes, but his research dealt with the effects of that uh, increasing CO2, specifically on the nutrient level of rice, which he found in most strains of rice decreased in some areas sharply. Are there efforts now to create strains of rice that can handle higher CO2 levels that we're seeing now and will continue to see in the near future? That's a really good question, Chris, and one that's really important. It's, it's not only the right uh, issue on rice, but it is in other crops as well. It, it turns out that with higher temperatures, uh, when you get a certain amount, uh, above a certain threshold, uh, the plant turns to making more carbohydrates and less protein. And of course, we need the protein for, for good nutrition. Uh, there's some breeding going on using genetic, genetics from wild varieties of rice or from corn and other crops to see if, this, if, if that effect is seen in all the wild germplasm, all the native plants that are related to corn or to rice. Uh, and in some cases, we're finding some varieties that do better than others. Uh, that kind of information will be will be brought back through classical plant breeding or through let's what we call cis genetics or maybe even gene editing. Uh, it will take some some work to continue to to uh, reduce the impacts of of high CO2 levels and high temperatures. Uh, the one that concerns me uh, through climate change. One of the things that concerns me, Chris, is that at higher temperatures, which is now more endemic in the Southwest. We have more water in the Midwest, That's as predicted by climatologists 10 years ago, that's what would happen. And, and as that happens, you, we, we end up with, uh, with, with crops that are, are not as able, to, not able to, to grow as fast, and they don't reproduce as well. The same thing in cattle. High temperatures affect the fecundity or reproduction of cattle and other animals as it, as it does in plants. And uh, as we come to understand why that happens, we can then use uh, novel genetics or uh, to, uh, to to bridge those gaps, developing varieties that where the where the pollen grain doesn't die, where it doesn't dry out and, and die, but is able to pollinate the uh, the egg on the uh, in, in rice or or wheat and, and corn. Uh, but it takes more investment in science, and one of the things that we're looking where we're, we hope for is that we have the continued support of Congress. And, uh, and the American public for basic research to discover how this work, how this happens. The challenge is then to use that knowledge through modern genetics, which itself is not always accepted by the consumer. In order to and putting those two things together uh, and showing that that uh, the knowledge can be beneficial takes an understanding uh, of the potential and then the applications and adoption of the science. Uh, we're in a transition period where science, uh, where we don't know as, as much about science as we should. Uh, I'd lament the fact that 40 years ago we had 25% that were really science literate, and this year <laughs> we still have 40%, uh, 25% that are that are science literate. We haven't changed the dial very much. Uh, we had a nice boost after Sp Sputnik, but we need another one of those. Uh, and we need it to be for our, our the, the, the Americans that are here now. We can't continue to rely on imported talent, which we have done. Um, so we have a we need a Manhattan Project for education, and that's something that I'm proposing. We are proposing at the National Science Board uh, for for Congress to listen to, for the Office of Science and Technology Policy, for states to get on board and do their share. Um, so I've got some passions, and there it goes now beyond science, and it really is helping America to be successful in the adoption of science and technology in food and agriculture. That's my driver. 
Dr. Beachy, Jim Vonderheit, thank you so much for this fascinating and wide-ranging program. We're out of time now. As a reminder to our audience, this will be recorded and posted to veilsymposium.org. You can also see the rest of our programs. We have programs going up until October 22nd when we take a brief hiatus before starting up again in December. I hope you will join us on Thursday, September 10th, when we welcome Dr. John Hausdorfer. And the topic is, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? Thank you all for joining us tonight, and good night to you all. <laughs>